comes up. All right, I'll turn it to you, Laura. Thank you. Sure. Um, I'm so not used to like having the case first. <laughs> I know it's different, right? <laughs> um, is that is that sort of standard at this point, or is it is it variable? No, so it's variable, honestly. But with the the original uh, projects, we usually do the case and then the didactic. But I know with like PPW, campus mental health, it kind of goes like um, after the didactic. So we're flexible. We could always do the didactic first, okay. whatever you want, like. No, this is good. Um, so, uh, Mark, I did choose a case that is related to the topic. I was trying to do that. Um, so, uh, do you want to? We can scroll down. So I can't read that. So I need my glasses. Um, so this is. Um, oh, great! Thank you. So this is an individual that we are currently working with in our IOP program, and it's a 30-year-old male um, who has opioid use disorder. He is currently on probation and is re was required to come to IOP as part of his probation because he was struggling with relapse. Uh, he first came in to see us and was not clear he was going to be able to transition off of um, opioids. He was using fentanyl uh, IV. And it was very high risk, so we recommended he go into um, kind of a short-term inpatient to get initiated onto medication. He did not want to be on buprenorphine. He was very, very adamant he did not want to be, be on buprenorphine, but he was open to taking naloxone. Um, one of his main reasons was fear of experiencing withdrawal. It were he to be reincarcerated, and I think he felt. He was not sure if he was really going to be able to remain sober. So reincarceration felt like um, a real possibility. And, and he really just didn't want to experience the withdrawal. He had experienced that before, having been on buprenorphine before. So he did come back to us after doing um, kind of a short-term detox where he got initiated. He, he got enough time off um, short-acting opioids that he could be initiated on to uh, naltrexone and for some people, uh, well, as people know, um, initiating onto um, a full opioid antagonist after using fentanyl can be very difficult. And oftentimes people really do need the support of an inpatient setting in order to be able to do that, which, which he felt like he needed. So we were, we were really grateful that he was willing to go. Um, so he is, um, there's, there's two questions related to this individual. We would love to see him on Vivitrol because when you take um, oral medication, you have to remember to take it, whereas Vivitrol, you don't. Uh, and sometimes people forget to take it or have ambivalence about taking it. Whereas if that happens when you're on um, an injectable medication, it, it's not going to put you at risk for overdose. He has overdosed approximately 12 times um, during his lifetime. And so he's he's very high risk and, and he acknowledges acknowledges that. But we've not convinced him <laughs> to, to start taking the Vivitrol. Um, it's unclear to, clear to me uh, exactly why. I mean, he doesn't, he's not crazy about the idea of an in injection. Um, but uh, we are we are still talking with him about that. The other interesting piece to him is he did not want to sign a release for us to talk to probation. Probation only tests him um, approximately once a month, and he's been pretty honest with us about knowing how to get around uh, those tests um, and knowing exactly how long it takes for fentanyl to come out of his system. And so he's 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 done some manipulation of, of the drug screening and he's been really honest with us ab about that. Um, so uh, he wants us to write him a letter at the end of IOP and he has only had one negative urine drug screen so far. Um, so he wants us to give him that letter. And there's some, our treatment team has had some discussions about um, should we release a letter directly to him? Should we require him to give us a, this is, we're, I'm, I'm on to the like questions, sorry. <laughs> uh, I'm not reading this verbatim. Um, 
so the the questions for um the group are around uh what other people do with regard to releasing letters uh to probation or parole or cps if the person doesn't sign a release some people release it directly to the individual who's in treatment and they can do what they want with it other people feel very strongly that there's no way i'm doing that you know they could alter the letter um, and it doesn't feel um it doesn't feel very good to to do that so uh questions around that and then also retaining individuals in treatment who are on um oral naltrexone or vivitrol uh, has been a struggle for us so he has indicated that he wants to remain in individual therapy after IOP ends, but in my experience, oftentimes, you know, people will, with the best intentions, say that and end up, um, if they're if they're on an opioid antagonist, not remaining in, in treatment because there's no kind of immediate withdrawal consequence if they drop out of treatment. So those are the two, the two questions uh, for the group. Thank you so much for the case, Laura. Um, excellent presentation. And I'm happy to pull up the case um, if anyone wants to refer back to it. But any clarifying questions or Shelby, I see you unmuted there. Would you like to comment? Yeah, so he didn't sign a release of information to the probation, correct? Correct. I wouldn't write a letter and I've worked with several probationers. Um, typically the probation officer will have a form that the that the program or the clinician or the therapist, doctor, whoever fills out to um, confirm that they've attended treatment. Um, it sounds like he's trying to manipulate y'all into writing a letter for him. Um, I, I just, I, I think that would enable him. Yeah. So maybe, um, has anybody agreed to writing the letter for him? So um, it's a, it's an ongoing discussion. So any letter we would write would have to document uh, all of his positive urine drug screens, mm -hmm. uh, which he may be not very excited about. Um, okay. Because he's only had one negative drug screen. And so we've had that conversation. Okay. Did he say why he didn't want to sign that release of information? So he has some mistrust of uh, the legal system, understandably, although I got to tell you that his probation officer has given him um, a lot of like leeway and chances because he's tested positive for them also, which is why they recommended IOP to begin with. So um, they have they have not violated him and sent him this time uh, back back to jail, which he knows is is a real possibility should he continue to to test positive. But it's it's just I think mistrust and 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 he has readily admitted sort of in the past and hit part of his history is to try and kind of game the system um, while not going back to jail and figuring out a way to use periodically and not go back to jail. So he's he's really been he's been honest about that. And I think that's consistent with, you know, saying I'm not going to sign a release but I need this letter. Thank you for the questions and comments. Any other comments or questions from the group? So I don't know if anyone has any thoughts about retaining uh folks on um on antagonist medication uh, longer term in treatment if they if people have strategies or recommendations around that. I know we just have had one patient who were able to um, retain in treatment, but that patient was highly motivated. Um, they're on withdrawal because that was a healthcare professional. Other than that, we've also had similar issues. Oh, see, no, then we have, we have another one. Um, who actually did very well, failed buprenorphine, failed methadone, but is doing now fantastic on um, the ritual in the past three years. But to me, it seems like the success rate is much lower unless you are very highly motivated and ha usually is linked to your job. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And as for the PO officer, I didn't know we could give it a letter um, if a patient didn't sign. So I would have not given one. 
And also thanks for the heads up that they can also let us. And until I woke, until I watched Breaking Bad, I didn't even know that was possible. You, wait, what? Until you watched Breaking Bad, you didn't know what was possible? You could alter those types of letters. Oh, yeah, yeah. All it takes is Adobe and a scanner. It's yeah, so it was so cool. Yeah. Um, so, Laura, was he mandated to do an IOP or just recommended by his um, probation officer? Um, so the language that they used with him is unclear since we've not <laughs> talked to the actual probation right. officer, right? Um, so he, I, I, I don't know. I don't know. He's, he came because they recommended it um, because he was struggling to stay to stay sober. It was not clear whether they said, if you don't do it, we will violate you and send you back to jail. That that is he didn't say that explicitly. That could be the case, but we are not exactly clear on that. Yeah. Laura, one more. It's, I was just I didn't mean to interrupt you. I was just going to ask what drugs were he was he testing positive for? Uh, fentanyl. Just fentanyl. Yep. Yeah. So in the ideal world, we'd be dealing with all of these things as a team with law enforcement. We know the reality is not that. And so as medical clinicians are caught in that. And so I actually, you know, people can alter the letter, but like any other patient a letter saying they were in my office and stuff, would they write? Yeah, I would. So there's kind of that, that, you know, who's my responsibility to? It's to the patient, not to the probation officer. Um, and we're dragged into that relationship. Um, and it really makes our, you know, many, most of our patients want us to talk to their probation officer because they're doing well or they, you know, that's kind of, or they're being mandated or, you know, some people would say coerced into that. Um, and so, you know, it's, I, I probably wouldn't have a problem writing him the letter, but it would be very clear as to what it is. And I would definitely keep a copy because it'll come back and he'll, it could be altered and all that. But, you know, people can, people can alter, write whatever they want nowadays um, with anything. It's pretty easy to, to falsify any of that. So it's not going to go very far without your, the probation officer checking with you. So I'm worried about that too much. Yeah, we have been working on increasing his engagement, um, and Dr. Husted works with this individual as well. And I've actually seen an increase in that engagement over time. He was he was marginally engaged in the beginning, um, and is is much more engaged, and and that's been helped with some of the individual therapy that he's he's come to. So my hope is by the end of his time in IOP, and he's agreed to stay a little bit longer because he hasn't had that many negative uh, drug screens, um, he will be fine with signing the release. But that would be best case, uh, best case scenario uh, if we can just like not have to have that be a struggle at the end. But we'll see. I don't know if you want to chime in, Jeremy. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, from a prescriber perspective, he was very challenging because he kind of got dropped on me. And it's a guy who's chronically used heavy high-dose fentanyl and then he comes in and he says, but I don't want to be on any medicine. So, it, you know, in, in, if you take a step back, you're basically saying, well, this individual is asking me to commit medical malpractice by treating him, but not giving him medicine, any medicine. He didn't want naltrexone. He didn't want anything. And so it took, what was it, about a month before he was even agreeable to taking naltrexone. Um, well, he so was just with us for a week and then he went on his on his own to detox. Yeah. But then he didn't start taking his medicine for another couple of weeks after that. So it was it was definitely challenging because just knowing he was kind of out in the wind and he was using and he refused to take anything. Um, it was it was a difficult situation. And he was definitely somebody that kind of keeps you up at night because you'd, you'd get lab results back and it'd be, you know, 100 greater than 100 fentanyl, greater than 1000 or fentanyl. So high, heavy dose. Um, not mild use at all. Um, but he, he, one of the interesting things he said about why he didn't want to take naltrexone or any, really any medicine, his thing with naltrexone was he thought if he was on it and he decided that he wanted to use, that he would use so much to a point that he may accidentally overdose by overusing, try to overcome the blockade effects, which I thought was kind of an interesting uh, reason to avoid taking medicine. But, you know, there's some logic to it. So, 
that was just a kind of an interesting piece of resistance that maybe you may encounter in the future if you haven't already. So, yeah, and I think it's challenging because we can't make people um, take medication, and and so um, it can it can present some challenges when the alternative feels very very high risk. And as Laura and I discussed before, uh, we don't have to treat people either if they're not willing to follow medical advice. So that was one of the challenging things at times to say, you know, I didn't know if I really wanted to have him considered a patient of mine because I wasn't doing anything except standing back and watching somebody implode. So it's challenging, but he's marginally doing better. So we'll see. I actually think he's doing much better, but <laughs> yes, we'll see if he if he shows up to his screens. <laughs> Any other comments or questions from the group? And I guess it just between Dr. Husted and um, Laura, it looks like there's nuances of philosophy of care. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and keeping somebody engaged versus, you know, it's the whole harm reduction mandated treatment. There's a whole broad gray zones. And, and I think we all, we, many of us try to walk that line and, yeah. and we kind of, and is it better to keep somebody engaged? But there are sometimes, you know, that's not the their best interest, you know, if they're not following through, they're not, you know, it, I can, I can see that Dr. Husted, but at the same time, I have seen people that, the fifth time the tape to us, they they do do better. So I, I don't know. I think we try to individualize it, but it, it's a tough one. And I think in West Virginia, we kind of fall in the middle. I think I'm on other echoes with other people. Some places are really very patient driven and others are more law enforcement driven. And so it's, it's, it's a tough, tough situation. I think I, I don't have a good answer. I know I just decide, I don't know if it's fair, but individually, you know. I think it's good too, to approach things a little differently. Like if everybody in the treatment team thinks the exact same thing all the time, that can be a dangerous place, mm -hmm. you know, group think. So, you know, having slightly different ways to go about it is, is a positive and hopefully that leads to better outcomes than if somebody is sort of autocratically determining what to right. do. So. And that's another reason it's good that there are different programs for people. They do, some do better in one program than others, and they can choose and shop around. So I do think that makes a difference too. We'll have to update them, Laura, when we, you know, if we ever get that letter in, we'll see. <laughs> yeah, we will definitely. Yeah, and I think I think um, David, you bring up a good point around, you know teams and working on interdisciplinary teams. And I am not a prescriber, right? And so my perspective is different than, than Jeremy's and, and it's important to kind of have these discussions on the teams and come to some consensus and, and agreement about how we're gonna treat folks because we do come from different professional kind of orientations. Hey, Laura, it's Jeremy, um, the other Jeremy. Did did you all consider reaching out to the probation office and talking in general terms about releases ahead of time and that kind of thing to see if you can cut this off at the pass? <clears throat> no, I, so we could have said, we're not going to treat you unless you sign a release or we're not going to provide you a letter. And we could have said in the beginning of treatment, um, we could have been clear with the patient. I wouldn't necessarily reach out the, to the probation. I mean, my in my experience, probation that we deal with uh, in, in Mon County and the surrounding counties. They don't have forms for us to fill out. It's it's a letter and, okay. and CPS, you know, it's it's a letter. Um, I, I've just noticed sometimes they'll, if you, if you call the office, at least up here um, and just say, hey, we're noticing we're getting referrals from you all. It, is there some kind of form that we can have in place in general? That way, in case anything happens, we could let you know and they might be the one that could get those signed for you. That way you're not stuck here. Um, trying to reach and they're doing the, the the work, getting those signed ahead of time before mm -hmm. they come to you. So I don't know, maybe something like that, but I agree too. We, we probably would have wrote the letter anyway, had we been in your position. <laughs> I know if they're working with Mon Defender, they try to get them like a form to fill out or just to sign, hey, I had this appointment with this person. Um, 
How often does he do uh, UA? Or, to do yes. it. He's supposed to do it usually like two or three times a month, but he's he's been pretty inconsistent, missed some. He so, claims he only gets called once a month. I don't know if that's true or not, but we've generally been trying to do it more like twice or three times. Um, but yeah, IOP, it's it it's kind of hit or miss how often they get called. Typically, twice a month. <laughs> Is it pretty consistent with like every time it's a it pops up with fentanyl, or are there times where it doesn't? No, it's, so, it's either been no fentanyl or fentanyl. Well, the Just first, kind of back and the forth. first, the first two or three, I can't remember if it was two or three, were positive. The third one was negative, and the last one, interestingly, um, had I can't remember the levels. Jeremy it was like one point five was yeah. like the level, and no norfentanyl. So we think it was actually maybe a contact um, exposure because it was no norfentanyl. But my my only last final comment would be I would really push harm reduction with him. You know, make sure the Narcan's there if he's going to use use with other people, and I would consider yeah. fentanyl test strips. You know, yeah, he he definitely has both Narcan and Fentanyl's test strips. We are all about that. He, yes, we've confirmed. <laughs> right, confident, yes. All right. Thank you all so much for the comments. Um, in the interest of time, we can go to the next case. But before we do, uh, Laura, was there anything else you wanted to have addressed or maybe bring up with the group? I didn't want to rush anything with the cases because I know how important they are as well. So. No, I appreciate uh, the comments, feedback, uh, and the discussion. Thank you. Absolutely. And thank you so much again for the case, Laura. And thank you all for the comments. All right, Jen, I will pull up your case now. Um, and as always, just let me know when you'd like me to scroll up or down. Um, okay. Are you able to see that okay, Jennifer? Yeah. Can you make it? Is there a way to make it a little bigger? Oh, yeah, that's good. Thank you, Mitra. No problem. Um, that was a really interesting case and a really interesting discussion, you all. Uh, I was a little bit late, but anyway. So um, this patient is co-managed by me and uh, my partner, Angie Barker, who is also on the call. She's a 41-year-old uh, Caucasian female with Medicaid. She... Um, was referred to us by our local, what is locally called drug court, I like to call it adult treatment court, about a year ago, a little more than a year ago. Um, her drug of choice was heroin. She'd been sober, when she came to us, she um, had been sober for a year or more. And she was referred to us because she, um, at the time, was struggling with relapsing. Um, and um, she was actually her relapse started with her drinking alcohol and then, um, um, using heroin. Um, she, this, I, I made the case several weeks ago. So some of the numbers are a little bit off, but she has about 154, um, days of sobriety and is currently on eight milligrams BID of, um, Suboxone. And, um, one interesting point about her is that she, even though she has those 154 days, when she relapsed, she, um, you know, three months ago or whatever, 154 days ago, she, um, almost six months ago, she was not truthful about it until we confronted her. She was really, I would say in a lot of, or in some in some denial, she she was really looking at the sobriety that she had had and just saw this as a small slip up, um, which which may in fact be true, but she was really not um, admitting it in clinic and until she was confronted by the court. And so there was just some kind of covering it up or minimizing might be a better word um, that has always been a concern to me. So um, she had just been stable in our program for four months and advanced to our biweekly group. Um, she had also advanced in court and had gotten a full-time job as a flagger, making really good money. She had done that before. She had her own apartment, was living on her own, was doing pretty well. So on 
just about a month ago, she was being driven to work by a coworker and their car slammed into a stone wall head on as she was getting off of, as they were getting off an exit. And her knee, I don't even have the orthopedic report on it, but it was, um, the word she used was crushed. Um, very severe knee injury. She, um, interestingly, the day she was seen at the orthopedist's office, the orthopedic PA called me and, um, it was, or the patient called me and put me on the phone with the orthopedic PA because they wanted to prescribe her um, Percocet at the time. And uh, they were going to, they saw her on a Tuesday. She was, she was supposed to have a surgery on Friday um, or Norco, I guess it was hydrocodone. Um, so, so they, so we talked about her taking the Norco and I kept her on the Suboxone. Um, interestingly, she um, was, she eventually had surgery and was prescribed, pre-op she was prescribed Percocet. This has been an ongoing story. Pre-op she was prescribed Percocet for about five days. Post-op she was prescribed Percocet for about five days. Um, and I stayed in touch with her and the counselor stayed in touch with her really pretty closely throughout this whole time. And interestingly, there's just a lot of elements to this story. It's, it feels a little bit disorganized, but interestingly, the orthopedist told her that when, after surgery, um, to stop her Suboxone while she was taking the Percocet. And she tried that for two days, but went into withdrawal. And so she restarted it, which I was glad. And I had spoken to her prior to all this, that she might get some pain coverage from the Suboxone, that it would, um, you know, probably blunt the effects of the um, opioid um, medications a little bit, but that she should just, you know, try to take the prescribed medication and maybe try taking it less than prescribed to see what she could do. And we stayed in close touch with her. Of course, this was devastating for her. Um, you can just imagine how horrible this would be for anybody, but for somebody in her situation, it was just, just when she was um, getting back on her feet, no pun intended. So most recently, um, what has happened is right before the New Year's holiday, she, so they tapered her from Percocet, I think, to hydrocodone, and then they tapered her off the hydrocodone, or they just gave her hydrocodone and said, we're not prescribing you any more pain medication. And she um, is off the hydrocodone and Percocet now. She interestingly had um, sort of a post-op complication that I thought might have been a DVT. It turns out it wasn't. I sent her to the air. She was having tremendous swelling in her leg and a tremendous pain in her foot and leg, not even in her knee. Um, and I just encouraged her to stick with Tylenol and um, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories um, at that point. The, the um, Another sad part about this is that the orthopods have advised her non-weight bearing for three months, not even any physical therapy for three months. She's now about, I think, six weeks, or maybe not quite six weeks, four weeks, maybe. Um, and so, and the other elements of this are, um, of course, that now she's, you know, not working. She doesn't have any income. Um, the court is helping her with finding um, legal aid, trying to figure out if she can get workman's comp for this because because they were driving to work. There's a question of whether or not she, you know she could get file this under comp. Um, she's continued with counseling. She moved, had to move out of her apartment because it has stairs. She was living with her mother for a while, which was an okay, but not great situation. She told me she had an offer to move in with a friend while she was recuperating. I'm not quite sure where she is living now. Um, and so it's, you know, an interesting case at a lot of levels. As um, Angie is fond of saying, some people don't have any luck at all, not even bad luck. <laughs> she says this is just such a horrible situation for this person. Um, she my main question, um, which I 
I always struggle with this is about opioid pain medication um, in the acute setting, so post-op or post-trauma. And um, how I handled this was to try to collaborate with ortho. That sort of slid off um, after the first contact. It was really great to begin with. Um, but to, um, I saw it as an appropriate use of acute opioid pain management, and I talked to the patient, and, the, and I advised her to continue her Suboxone. Um, I didn't think that there was any uh, possibility that we increase her Suboxone for pain medication just because of insurance coverage, and I don't, I've never done that before. Um, uh, so, th so my main questions when I turned it in were about how to, you know, help this person with pain management in the acute setting. Now it's, you know, been a little bit late and she's off the opioids and I'm, I'm not going to restart any opioid pain medication, obviously. So just trying to support her in other ways. Um, um, so if anybody has any feedback or thoughts on that, I would appreciate it. Thank you so much for the case, Jennifer. Excellent, as always. Um, yeah, any comments, feedback for Jennifer? And I can pull up the case if anyone needs to refer back as well. You know, also, I said she had been, she had a year of sobriety before she came to us, but I think she had had more like a couple of years. I, I'm sorry, I don't have that detail. Jennifer, I'm sorry. Did, is she still on the Suboxone? Yes. So she's still on eight milligrams BID. And she um we've not seen her in the program because since she's been going through this, we've just been doing telehealth with her. We're we're not really doing telehealth anymore, but she may have come in today. I'm not sure today was the day she was supposed to come in. Thank you. And I encouraged her to come in today because clearly she's able to um with assistance. And I thought it would be really good for her to get back into the program with peers. Everyone is welcome to chime in as well, and you can also chat in. I'm happy to read out any chats. Uh, Jennifer, you'd said, uh, have you never done uh, pain, like uh, a pain dose of spark? I don't know if it would have been enough for it. I never have. It's... um. It can often get covered. Typically, the way we'd write it was this, they were on 16, the dose. Right. Okay. So usually what we'll do is write the normal script and then have a separate script for pain where it, we'll put like take a quarter twice a day, uh, BID, PRN as needed for pain. So basically pushing them up towards 20 milligrams. Um, so write it as a separate script, but then have clear guidelines and what we tell patients is sometimes medicaid will cover it um i don't know what insurance was then she had a job or the workman's comp or whatever it's going on but um if it's a couple films sometimes it's mentally having a little bit extra you can take again more as a as needed basis sometimes that can avoid some of the additional things um you can uh, a lot of pharmacies will allow people to pay cash for the additional pain doses if it's real clearly written out. So we've, we just had somebody that had a bunch of dental extractions today and that's exactly what we did. But we we have been doing that for years and usually it goes through okay. Or maybe it takes one short phone call to a pharmacy just saying, hey, this is what we're doing and why. Um, sometimes if you know if it's gonna be a longer type of pain, <clears throat> it is kind of better to send in a couple weeks worth at a time so you don't have to be calling Medicaid too often. But um, yeah, it's it's a little frustrating to hear that the um, orthopods didn't really consult you at all and just throw in opioids at them while knowing that they're still on um, medicine the whole time. Um, there is something to be said with mixing the two, just because it, it can break through and help a little bit with pain, but it's it, it's not going to be super effective. And probably the films would have been or additional films may have been better in a way. So. Well, I, I have a difficult case. Yeah. Lady. 
Yeah, it was difficult. Thank you for that. I feel like I'll be better prepared next time. I could have called the orthopedist um, after that, although I was particularly appalled that he asked her to stop her suboxone. Yeah, down here in Weston, Dr. Gorby typically will call in like extra pain doses. And I'm the one that calls rational drug therapy and gets those approved. And I usually don't have any problem at all getting a temporary dose. They'll usually, the most they'll do is like 90 days at a time approved. Of course, you don't have to send that much, but um, yeah, they, they usually will cover it. And that's yeah. usually a override, not a prior auth, I believe. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's what I meant to say. Yep. Yeah, so you don't have to like fax anything in. It's just a phone call, and they can yeah go to the override part instead of the prior auth part. So okay, that's, that's great. Good. Thank you. That's, that's good to hear because it didn't used to be a couple years ago, and I quit trying, so I'll have to try again. <laughs> I've just been hit, having people pay cash, um, but they, it usually works. Um, but it's interesting, you know. It sounds like Jennifer. Um, just in the past would have not given these patients any pain meds. So it's kind of, where are we again on that transition? And, and there are some hospitals even that are asking people to wean off before surgery. So we've had to kind of do a lot of education. Um, fortunately where we are, we're, it's pretty good. It's not a big issue, but I actually prepared a letter for some of my patients that when they were going to be having surgery about those things that said, you know, this is my recommendation, you know, it's actually a dot phrase and epic that I put in that I would send them, you know, dear so-and-so, this is what I usually do with them. Um, and, you know, some have appreciated it, some I've never heard from again. So it just, you know, patients get pretty anxious about those things. Um, but most of those have been kind of planned surgeries versus, you know, kind of acute things that happen to them. The other time it comes up is with dental procedures, and it's pretty common um, for them also to prescribe a benzodiazepine, um, like Valium prior to, but um, um, my experience with that is they say, hold your Suboxone the day of surgery, take a Valium, a Valium one, and then restart your Suboxone. And I've sort of let that um, go. I don't know if that's what you all consider. Um, appropriate or standard? I usually tell people to just stay on their Suboxone, uh, irregardless of what they're told it pre-op or <laughs> I just tell them keep taking it. Okay, good. Yeah. And do you, uh, and do you object to the Valium or do you, just, uh, you know? Um, Personally, like yes. Um, but I guess it would be dependent on, on the patient or individual circumstance, but usually I don't endorse that either. Okay. That's helpful. Thank you. One. Yeah, with me, I tell them to go ahead and take the benzo, um, especially if it's someone who's very scared of the surgery. And I haven't had much problems with that. So I guess maybe I'm a little free with that. My last question, is, unless people have other thoughts, is, you know, she's now close to four weeks out from surgery. I don't know how she's doing. I haven't spoken to her this week, but I'm not too eager to offer her um, an increased dose of her Suboxone for pain, but I also don't want to be harsh. I don't know how, when acute, you know, it's always the question, when does acute pain become chronic pain? Um, any thoughts on that? She had a full dental extraction. What did she have? No, this was this was I'm I'm kind of mixing um, issues. This patient was had a knee had a knee um, frac a severe knee fracture crushed, and I don't even know the details of the surgery, but it was quite a dramatic injury, and she has hardware in her knee and um, is non weight bearing for three months. And um... okay, I actually had a similar patient with ankle, and I I did give increased suboxone for I think about four months and medicate, she's on Medicaid, they did approve. And then, cause I gave her a, a, a pretty set um, cutback time. I'm like, when you're doing rehab and doing this stuff, I'm gonna give the um, the extra. And then when you're done, we're gonna stop. And it, she, she worked out great. She went back to work and everything, it was fine. Oh, wow, that's good, okay. Okay, and do you, so, so let me just be clear, a quarter of a dose BID, 
um, as needed for pain, pushing up towards 20 milligrams. That's what you said, right, Dr. Houston? Yeah, yeah, it's usually what we do. I mean, you could potentially go a little bit more, but that's still keeping it well within uh, the bounds. So and the other thing would be to have them divide the dose, of course. So kind of divide your right. dose four times a day, half film four right. times a day, and then the additional like quarter for breakthrough as needed. So, yeah. Okay. This is all very, extremely helpful. I appreciate it. Thank you all so much for the comments. And um, I want to leave some time for the didactic as well. But before we transition over, were there any other comments, questions, Jen, you had for the group? Nope. That was great. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you so much. I'm happy we're able to present this today. We really appreciate your time and you as well, Laura, for the, the case earlier as well. So thank you both so much for the time and the two cases. Um, all right, Mark, I will turn things over to you. I gave you the ability to share screen, but I have your PowerPoint on my end as well as backup. So I'll turn things over to you now. Sounds good. Can everyone hear me just to double check? <laughs> yes, sir. We can. Thanks. I wasn't holding them back there, Jennifer, or um, or I believe on the other case either, but there was so much going on in those. Those cases were good golly. Um, one note too, um, we, we are pretty blessed here in West Virginia. Uh, the comments of calling rational drug, aka like, uh, you know, Medicaid and all that, and getting a human who happens to be a pharmacy professional is not synonymous in the other states and territories. So that that's uh, certainly a good thing. Uh, a little bias since I used to work there. So there's that. All right. Um, the beauty of Echo is when you're presenting, you're either going to have 18 minutes or 60 minutes. Have at it. So we're going to do this. Naloxone. Um, I'm really glad that I actually included the first three or four slides just based on the first case that we went over today. Uh, so here's the pharmacist in me. Wonderful med cam. I believe we already had the Breaking Bad reference, but... Um, just going over the similarities on the med chem side. Uh, if you start with oxymorphone and the, then you end up with naloxone, naltrexone, and almaphene. That's all great and all that. They look similar. That's all you really, you don't even need to know. You just can know. But uh, we had references earlier to naltrexone. Um, a lot of times it ends up being said as naloxone, but it's of course naltrexone. Um, one thing I did want to bring up uh, in very quick one slide on this guy. Um, the, you know, we're used to, particularly in this realm with uh, SUD, uh, the typical doses, but there is, of course, the low or very low, um, tiny little doses, low do LDN, low dose naltrexone. Ironically enough, uh, has a potential uh, utility in pa various pain conditions. Um, we're learning more and more about that, and it's uh, the effects within the immune system, basically, overall. There's an orphan drug. There's a couple other um, possibilities out there as far as getting these things. And of course, also uh, if uh, compounding pharmacies will still do that along the way too. So in fact, LDN was actually something like 57,000 other things that was studied within the COVID realm um, as far as uh, potentially it being, re it was research for taking care of long COVID along the way too. So lots more research coming with that. Now, the other one was nalmaphene. Uh, so if you want to compare that directly to naloxone, uh, it's I got a lot more a lot more magnetism to the receptor, a lot more binding affinity. So you're getting more bang for your buck, perhaps. Um, the mechanism of how it works, um, a pharmacist, they worry about the dose and then how it works. Um, when we were talking about that benzo earlier, and that there was a tiny little part of me known as my entirety that was like, oh my goodness, what's the dose of that benzo and which one? Um, so there's that there too. No worries. Uh, but nalmaphene is actually an inverse mu agonist. What in the globe does that mean? Uh, it binds the same way as an agonist, but it's producing the opposite effect. There's pretty much that. Um, this is something that's available out there now, as you see here as a nasal spray. All right, turns out we're actually here to talk about naloxone, so let's have at it. Here's a chart I put together to try and put uh, to get a quick one hitter here for um, what's available. Like what products do we have in a market that is changing as I speak? Um, to my knowledge, this is actually still up to date. It should be for at least a couple of weeks, but it won't be for a couple months. Um, up at the top in the yellow, we have the injectables. In the bottom in the light bluish, uh, we have the nasal products, 
we can't even say nasal sprays anymore because there's another new one there. Uh, injectables up top, pretty straightforward, I guess we'll say. Uh, prescription or military use only. I've got a slide for that, don't worry. Uh, and then when you get into the nasal products, you got all over the place. Prescription, OTC, so on and so forth. Um, perhaps one of the bigger teaching points uh, for the use of them, though, would be when you have to put the kit together, the manual kit, you got to also take the extra step and spray it in each nostril. And then you can repeat it two to three minutes later. The prepackaged products are just one spray, one nostril. And then after the two to three minutes, you could do the other one. There is another product uh, from Pocket Naloxone called NaxSwab. I'll touch on it in a hot second here as well, too. Not available yet, but uh, coming to a shelf near you. So odds are you're probably like, what the heck was that military one you were talking about? So does everybody remember, I'm in presenter mode here, so it might be tough to see chats and all that, but um, on the video, raise a hand. Everybody remember the talking one that was $3,950? And that was no longer made as of October 2020, I believe. Or it's no longer made, basically. So back again, um, looks like the same device, a couple different colors, but our, our federal government on the military side was working with the manufacturer for this. So now we have this available for the bullet points listed here, actually, um, for big time scenarios. Now, remember the chart? Actually, I'll go back. I don't think I can go back. Um, the chart had also the newer nasal product. So that's, uh, I, don't, I don't have the picture here for us, but it looks like a Q-tip, uh, but it has naloxone on it or in it. We're not thinking like the COVID tests, really screenings, uh, the ones that went all the way up into our cranium. Um, these are just like a regular Q-tip. Um, the two different types of studies that the company has done, uh, they um, looking for FDA approval, of course. Uh, and unlike the other two, the Narcan OTC is readily available now, about 50 bucks. Uh, the uh, Revive product is now available, not so readily though. It's available through a few harm reduction efforts. And within the next two to three months, we should see it out there for a little bit more than half the cost of the other one. Uh, this one is going to be different, of course, uh, still has to get that punch for approval. Uh, and then we'll be out there and it's a different formulation. They did studies to see, will it work better? And when they say work better, it's exposure to the actual medicine in our body. And then the other studies they did were, um, will uh, lay public work better with this compared to a spray? So straight up with this, it would putting a something that is like a Q-tip in your nose be easier than spraying. There is a study. You can look there for more info. All right. So let's jump into some naloxone. Big picture, not necessarily the products, but the pearls along the way. Remember when my family and I ended up in Hawaii, got suckered into one of those deals where you open up the thing, get a pearl, and of course you have to make a necklace. But anyway, um, for naloxone, um, a lot of times we hear, oh, they're, um, darn it, this thing's recorded. We will hear other people say, oh, there's no side effects. And we, I, I always recommend folks to kind of stop and think there. If you say that a substance or a medicine has no side effects, I think we've been there before. Uh, for propaganda that might sound like that. Um, it's always about the dosage, of course, and what's the reality as well. So this and a couple slides later, we'll have some info here. But here's uh, an actual, it's just case uh, case reports, basically, but where they're saying there's a possibility for uh, pulmonary edema. The everything is in the details, of course, and the dose. Um, so if you're looking, I tried to highlight in red towards the right here. These cases were pretty appreciable doses um, of illicit substance, of course, primarily, uh, but then also the the doses of naloxone were, were not your typical initial doses. They were sometimes uh, high dose to begin with, and then utilized three, four times, um, if not seven or nine on here too. So that comes into play. Just wanted to share that with any everyone um, in case you hear those things. It's like, hey, yeah, but what was the dose? Uh, speaking of which, what's a um, single or multiple dose of naloxone? So here's a study I highlighted that was funded by uh, the manufacturer of the higher dose uh, nasal, nasal spray here, uh, talking about, you know, um, were, were people utilizing that second dose? Did they, did they jump the gun because there was a human dying in front of them and utilize the second dose? 
at or even before the two to three minute recommendation because again there's someone dying in front of them um so some information here as well too now how do we how do we get this stuff because the market has changed and will continue to change. So big picture, nothing new for everybody on, on this one here, but access uh, prescription, of course, harm reduction, and now OTC. So prescription has a, a history uh, every state, but ours, we had a board of pharmacy protocol enabling pharmacies to provide it with a, a prescription. Uh, billing it was a different story because it wasn't coming from a prescriber. We have had and now have a standing order um, and then there's, of course, a prescriber can just prescribe for it, of course, too. Nothing new there. Then we have harm reduction. Uh, to put that in one slide is beyond an injustice. You all know that. Um, so I, I'm going to try doing it in two here. Here's one form of, um, sure, everyone has seen these uh, with the vending machines, uh, but then also providing information along the way as well, too. And then like a real estate agent, it's all about location, location, location. So where do you put them? Here's some ideas here. Here's one from my own experience, though. So I was at a, a conference uh, outside the realm of pain or addiction. It was within pharmacy education. So I was up in Providence, Rhode Island, and I, I needed a break. So I stepped outside of the hotel, like I recommend everyone to do when you're at a conference, experience the actual city. Gosh forbid. And I, it was a beautiful day, as you can see with the picture I took on the left. I walked across the street. It was this beautiful park. It was one block of, of a park. It was General Ambrose Burnside. That's where we get burn sideburns from. Uh, Civil War statue, beautiful fountain place. It was beautiful. Beautiful day. Literally, this whitish gray van rolls up on the sidewalk, busts open the back, a little button, whips out a table and starts handing out um, harm reduction services. And I was like, wow. So, uh, of course, started just talking with the gentleman and was like, hey, I'm sure you get a lot of different humanity dealing with you. But um, just kind of wondering, you know, uh, let's skip the subtleties and say, why would you pick here? Like, why right here? Why did you almost bust your tire to get on this sidewalk? And he looked at me. He's like, sir, it's pretty simple. I believe he said 94% of the overdoses in our city happen in this park. Where else should I be? I'm like, shook his hand, carried on. I promise you I went back to the conference at some point. Um, it was pretty amazing, even for, you know, for all of us working within these realms. All right, so... Not too much of stories for OTC. They're out there. Is it the end end game, end goal for the Avenger fans out there? Um, it expands availability beyond pharmacies. It puts it out within society with all the places listed here. Cost is part of access. If something's 50 bucks, is it accessible to everybody? I'll cease most of the silly questions. Um, what about providing education? Um, down at the Dollar General, are they going to be educating people to educate others on it? I, maybe I don't want to DQ anybody, but you know, it's, it's something to take into account as well too. So naloxone dose, this kind of almost came up, I think in Jennifer's case, um, if I'm remembering right. So do we, we all love MMEs, right? More female gram equivalents and the half a dozen nuances that make them almost clinically irrelevant, but the law of the land. Well, if we have those, why don't we have, I made this up. There's no reference. Our MMEs, reversal MMEs. I mean, what's the dose to correlate to the dose, right? We're not there. Um, receptor capacity, all that stuff comes into play, but just points to ponder when people are looking for uh, things to do with grants, hey, maybe there's an option for you. Uh, as far as the dose, remember that other slide we had that I pointed out that it was the study was funded by a manufacturer. Same thing with this one. Um, this is not talking about multiple doses. It's talking about the actual dose needed to combat the heroin, aka fentanyl, that's that's out there, right? Uh, so I'll, in the interest of time, we'll leave this for homework for folks. Uh, but about hey, 10 years ago now, it's a new year. 10 years ago, the FDA convened, conveyed a panel, convened a panel to say, what's the perfect dose? Uh, all 14 agreed, I believe, almost all of them, that you can't say what the perfect dose of naloxone is because it depends on a lot of factors like the patient, the setting, and everything else. All right, another one here. Um, as for again, we're going over pearls with naloxone. So, opioid mu receptor affinity, the magnetism to the receptor. You probably and this, maybe you remember something like this when I went over buprenorphine at some point. But naloxone's kind of uh, I hesitate to say in the middle because when you look at those numbers, it's not in the in the middle there. But uh, that K value you're seeing the lower 
the K, the higher the receptor affinity. So that's why sufentanil and bupa are up top there. Um, the concern here becomes, well, what about everything having, you know, the ones that are on top having a higher receptor affinity than naloxone? presumably needing more naloxone to take care of an overdose. Things to keep in mind. A lot goes into this list, hence the 65 references at the bottom of this slide. And of course, uh, I can insult anyone's intelligence here. It's not just an opioid. Uh, there's other substances that are out there as well uh, within various uh, utilizations and overdoses, of course, too. All right, so... Jumping on that idea earlier when, we, when I was harping on the, oh, are there no side effects or other concerns with the naloxone utilization? Um, we, we have a, a case here in West Virginia, actually, that's a, a pretty interesting one. Um, it, it involves body cam footage from law enforcement that goes into this idea of, you know, what, what can happen if somebody is utilizing naloxone. Uh, but if somebody is um, utilizing uh, prescription opioid pain management uh, medication, and then they're given naloxone, the withdrawal is probably not going to be too fun. Everyone knows that. But what about when there's an absence of opioid utilization in that human? So here's some things you really got to dig deep for. Um, we put them straight forward here for you. But what else could happen if somebody doesn't have an opioid in them and then naloxone is given? So if you're one of the three humans on this planet that have congenital analgesia, which by the way, I did bring up with some friends earlier today. And once they realized I wasn't talking about their crotch, uh, we were able to actually have some education going on. Uh, congenital analgesia is when somebody cannot feel pain. Sounds magnificent is absolutely horrific because um, pain reminds us that something is going on, right? I uh, imagine with the kid touching the stove and he doesn't stop touching the stove. The story ends, right? I got two little boys. None of them want to be touching stoves, hopefully. Um, if somebody is given naloxone and they have this, they might actually be able to feel pain again. Uh, and the very it's a very rare condition, of course. Wikipedia could even go over it for anybody. Um, but things to keep in mind there. Also, uh, naloxone has uh, other opioid receptor activity, delta and kappa. It's very minor, uh, but could also monitor for things like tachycardia or hallucinations. But again, these things aren't exactly happening in everyone. So just looking at the big picture, trying to keep everybody's feet on the ground. This is one of my favorite things. Um, expiration date. So I disclaimer, I am not saying to go against whatever is on a product for an expiration date. However, this study featured on CNN is, um, it was conducted here in West Virginia. Some of our friends down in the Southern part of the state. I don't believe any of them are on this uh, presentation call or Zoom or whatever we're on here now, but um, this study was ongoing. I think we might be getting the five-year results here soon, but basically said, hey, this stuff's good after a year, a year after the expiration date. I am not saying that, That's, this study is saying that. CNN apparently wanted to cover it. I liken this to, again, not bucking the system of how we do expiration dates in our country or any other country, but uh, bottom left, you got uh, Mediterranean sea salt formed 250 million years ago and expires next month. Hmm. Back in my day, we said, here's your sign. All right. What about the kiddos? Um, we've got to uh, really remember uh, one of the things I was wondering, I think it was in the first case today was who, who's, who else is in the house? Actually, I think it might've been the second case. Um, and as far as when, when that, uh, yeah, it was the second case when that Norco and then the Perco were given, um, who else is around in the environment as well too. So, um, you know, really driving home that, uh, naloxone education at that point too. All right. So rural, uh, how we go? I got like a couple of seconds left. Our brain can only last so long without oxygen. So if there's no naloxone around and somebody is not breathing from an opiate overdose, an ambulance might not be enough. So we really got to work on getting naloxone out there into the environments, the settings. Um, I actually saw one two, three nights ago at my kid's basketball game over at Eastwood. Uh, and they had not only uh, naloxone in the defibrillator, but they also had an EpiPen, bright yellow thing on the wall. I, I don't get out much. I haven't seen that before. But these are things we got to keep in mind. Hence the location, location, location. You get on an airplane, hopefully they have it there too. And hopefully they have doors that work, right? Um all right, that that was more jovial, but um, you know, there's very, very few anymore conversations out there about how many is too, what's too much, and that's not my words. As far as you know, should someone be revived one, 
five, 10, 20 times. So I scraped this from the internet, good old social media. And uh, that, that gentleman to the right is Ken. He was revived 15 separate times. He's not in that picture if he wasn't revived 15 separate times. Sometimes a picture of a human works better than a urination contest conversation. So there's that. And there's other medical conditions that have relapses as well, too, as you hopefully see in the bottom left here as well. So one last thing here, um, Narcan party myth. So uh, here's some quotes. You can read them on your own time if you want of the whole uh, idea of people just shooting up heroin, AK fentanyl, like no mother because they have naloxone around. It's counterintuitive. Nobody wants to get withdrawal, right? Then why do we have media covering it? Here's down in Tennessee. I added the word myth on here. Um, they nicely put if Narcan parties. When people read that, they don't read if, right? So we got to, you know, we got to get out there and educate people, of course, too. There's a lot going on with naloxone. Uh, here's one uh, study that shows that uh, when when we as healthcare professionals intervene and provide naloxone education and perhaps even the products, um, in this study, it was one in eight people. Talk to eight people about it, save one life. I'm pretty sure we could all uh, uh, say, hey, half say that's really good or half say we can do better. And the other half, hmm, I had my coffee, don't worry today, would say something else. But um, the bottom line is this also proves that, hey, talking about it and educating patients and the public about it works. It it saves lives, right? Got to keep in mind the pearls. And since I stole another minute of your life here today, I also took another minute to put some music in here for you. Come on, you know me, folks. But do you know the song and what show it was in? I see some little, I don't know if they're emojis or whatever, but it's how to save a life. It's called naloxone. It's pretty straightforward, right? All right. I'm going to exit out of share screen so you don't have to listen to the song for the next 20 minutes. Um, but when I hear naloxone, that's literally what's going on in my head. So I hope that helps you as well. Perhaps a little pharmacology pearls there for you too. Thank you so, so much. Chasing yeah. cards is better. Okay, I'll give you that. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Thank you so much for your time. And what a great presentation. So much amazing information in there. And I'll be sure to share um, your presentation in the recap email. You guys have homework, but hey, it's because we had really good cases. Thank you both for those cases. Those were wonderful. Absolutely. Any comments, questions? I don't want to rush anyone. It was a great presentation. So if anyone has any comments to add or questions from Mark, please do ask away. Alrighty. And if we get any questions later on, you can always email myself or Elizabeth. We're happy to send them over to the presenter. So Mark, I will email you any questions we might get after the session is done. Um, my only announcement here today is that the next session will be on January 22nd and Laura Lander will be presenting on SUD and trauma, teaching patients advocacy skills. So that sounds really great as well. We can't wait for that, Laura. But thank you all so much for the case, the comments, questions, and Mark for the presentation today. Um, I hope you all have a wonderful week ahead of you. Take care.